Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is John Paul Jones. I'm the Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, and this is our sixth annual downtown lecture series. Uh, join me for a second in giving another round of applause to our prelude performer, Carla Fabris. <laughs> Carla is a volunteer at uh, Tucson Medical Center's Healing Arts Program, very innovative program, and I'm uh, delighted that uh, Julia Strange, the uh, Vice President for Community Benefit, what a great title, uh, has once again um, found a way to have TMC uh, support us here in the college at this downtown event. Uh, thank you very much, TMC. I'd also like to thank a few personal friends uh, who have donated their own money to uh, this event. Uh, our title sponsors are Mike and Beth Kasser of Hello Alua Companies. Um, our supporting sponsors are Ken and Linda Robin. And our community sponsors are Drs. Vivi and uh, Adib Sabah and Joanne Ellison and Barbara Starrett. Thank you very much for all of your support. We have media sponsors, and I want to start with the uh, Arizona Daily Star and the fine people behind the curtain here at um, uh, Arizona Public Media. And I saw Jack Gibson in the crowd tonight, and uh, it was nice to see him. And also Tucson's community-supported radio station, uh, KXCI. And um, I'm a supporting member of both AZPM and KXCI, and you should be too. KXCI, not incidentally, is, uh, now has a studio in another one of our sponsors' uh, locations, the Hotel Congress. And if you haven't gone by there and checked them out when they're on the air, uh, I encourage you to do so. 100 years old in November is Hotel Congress. And um, we have Richard and Shana Osran to thank for the fact that that institution is still over here on Congress Street. And I feel very much honored and bookend, uh, bookended by the fact that we are also supported by downtown Tucson's newest hotel, AC Hotel by Marriott. And I want to thank Rudy Dabut and Scott Stetler for their support of um, this series. Thank you uh, very much. We've also received support from um, uh, Park Tucson, although you wouldn't really know it tonight. Um, thank you, TMY. Make sure you go out on Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, Tucson's largest cultural event, 120,000 people, a collaboration between this college and the Southwest Folklife Alliance. Big shout out, Tucson Meet Yourself. and our other downtown partner, the members of the Downtown Tucson Partnership, and of course, uh, the Fox Theater. And I don't know how many of you in the audience here tonight know that you could, have be, you could be sitting in a parking lot if it weren't for some fine people supporting the Fox Theater. So thank you very much for all the people at the Fox. Now, it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce tonight's lecturer speaker, uh, Dr. Tawana Steptoe, who's an associate professor of history. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin, and then she went to uh, join the University of Washington, and we were delighted to be able to steal her away from the University of Washington, um, where she's a little closer to her roots, as you'll hear tonight uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, Tawana is a urban social historian with an emphasis on African-American history in the South and the Southwest, uh, but of course that uh, always implies uh, an, a fully Americanist experience in the, in the practice of history because of the Great Migration. She focuses on that experience through popular culture, folklore, religion, and relevant to tonight, uh, music. 
And music in particular, popular culture, but music in particular, uh, can be um, sometimes, un, uh, sometimes controversial uh, way to uh, examine uh, deep issues in history. Uh, not for people who are historians of popular culture, because they just, that's what they do, they, they are historians of popular culture. But if you're like uh, Tawana, you study uh, racial and ethnic formations and racial and ethnic subjectivities and the effects that both of these have on the lived experiences of African Americans, on urban growth and decline, on the changes that go on in the city, on those institutions, those deep questions, accessing those from music is a different kind of archive and frankly requires a different kind of uh, historian. And she is that sort of historian. And in one of the reviews of her book, which I think is very relevant not only to tonight's talk, but also to her arc of her own work. This person said, Americans think that they can hear race as well as they can see race. So therefore, that's why you validate the study of music and understanding of these deeper issues. Her 2016 book, Houston Bound, Culture and Color in a Jim Crow City was published by the University of California Press, and the next year it won awards from the Urban History Association and the Western History Association. And it was described as moving, sophisticated, and elegant. Before I introduce her, I want to mention that we will have a three-song set by Southwest Soul Circuit uh, immediately following uh, her talk. And um, in um, case you were wondering, um, this group will not be uh, going over to Hotel Congress after uh, uh, the lecture, but what you're going to hear tonight is very special, a really fantastic blues, rhythm, rhythm and blues, soul, and gospel group. But in the meantime, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Tawana Steptoe. Thank you. Good evening. Well, that's already a good start because we've got some call and response going tonight. So I can tell this is going to be a fun crowd. I hope you all are ready to listen to some tunes. All right. So how many of you were here last week for Jake Harwood? Excellent, excellent. So one of the things that Jake talked about last week was this idea that we often associate music with particular places. And he gave a few examples like polka from Germany, reggae from Jamaica. That idea is going to be something that I talk about also tonight. As a historian, a lot of my work deals with region. And I'm interested in why certain sounds emerge from certain places in specific times. It's one of my key research questions. So to get us started tonight, I want to play a song from a genre of music that is heavily associated with a particular part of the world. That region is Norteño music, or the type of music is Norteño. It's a type of music that we commonly associate with northern Mexico and especially the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Norteño music frequently uses an accordion and a string bass instrument known as a bajo sexto with Spanish lyrics. Now, if you're interested in Norteño and the roots of that, you should absolutely come back here in a couple of weeks for Celestino Fernandez, who's going to dig into the roots of Norteño. But to get this talk started tonight, I'm going to play an example of a Norteño song by an artist from Texas. All right, so that style of music, again, associated with northern Mexico, the borderlands. 
But the performer of that particular song is not a person of Mexican descent. Instead, it's Beyonce Knowles Carter. <laughs> and you all undoubtedly have heard this name. She's a mega star in popular music today. Beyonce was born and raised in my hometown, Houston, Texas. This is also the subject of my book, Houston Bound. Beyonce identifies as a black woman, specifically as a black Creole woman. Her roots are from Alabama as well as Southern Louisiana. Her father moved to Houston, migrated there as well as her mother. And her mother's people are Creole of color. A group of people from the parishes of Southern Louisiana, the rural parts as well as the urban center of New Orleans. Creoles of color identify as a mixture. They have West African roots, as well as French and sometimes Iberian. They're, they typically speak French, practice Catholicism. And there was a wave of Creole migration into Houston in the early 20th century, partly because of the Great Mississippi Flood of 1927 that destroyed farmlands in the Mississippi River Valley, but also because of labor opportunities. The Southern Pacific Railroad recruited Creole men to come to Houston to work. So you get an explosion of a Creole culture there in Houston that I'll also be talking about tonight. Now, as I said, I also grew up in Houston as well. And for me, the sounds of Creole music as well as Mexican music was part of Houston's soundscape. So much so that I realized after I left Houston that I associate those sounds of accordion and his Spanish lyrics with home. I went off to Wisconsin in 1999 to go to graduate school. And when I first got there, I met some new friends and they invited me over to a party. And these friends were watching a boxing match. And one of the boxers was a man of Mexican descent. And you know how before a boxing match, the boxers come out and they have this fantastic music. There's usually a big production before they take the ring. This particular boxer had Norteño music playing. He had a band there and someone with an accordion. And I was so overwhelmed with emotion, being so homesick on a cold winter night in Wisconsin, I started crying. I actually started crying because it made me homesick. And my friends were confused. They're looking at me like, why is she, this black woman, associating with Mexican music to the point that it moves her to tears? So I started explaining, but it, it sounds like home. And they said, are you Mexican? No, no, I'm not, but this is home to me. So how is it then that black girls from Houston come to hear Norteño music and think of home? I think of this as an example of the concept of polyculturality. Now, the, I first heard this word from the historian Robin D.G. Kelly. And Robin D.G. Kelly described polyculturality as a, as a blend, a cultural blend that most of us in the United States have, whether we know it or not. And polyculturality is based on our cultural heritage instead of ancestry. It doesn't matter what your DNA test from 23andMe say, Polycultural heritage is developed as a product of who you grew up around. And soundscapes are very important to that idea. Kelly argues that all African Americans are polycultural based, first of all, on the fact that our ancestors came from different parts of Africa. And enslaved Africans and the Americans blended cultures to create something new. So then, the root of African American culture is polycultural, but then it blends with so many other things at the same time. My research on Houston showed that polyculturality is often an outgrowth of migration, and that city's increasing racial and ethnic diversity. These are some population statistics from modern Houston. Today, the largest group there is Latinx, followed by white and African-American and then Asian-American. Some people call Houston the di most diverse city in the United States today. So migrations since the 19th century have shaped the polycultural heritage of Houston. 
in around 1836, the city was founded, and the majority of citizens at that time were Anglo-Southerners who came from the Southeast. And of course, those Anglo-Southerners brought with them enslaved Africans as well. In the early 20th century, Houston still had a very, very small Latino population, but it began to grow around the time of the Mexican Revolution in 1910 followed by that Creole exodus from Louisiana and into Houston in the 1920s. But then in the 70s and 80s, Houston began to diversify even more with people coming from South Asia and Southeast Asia, and then an increasing number of Africans, especially from the country of Nigeria. So what this means then is that a modern Houstonian, like someone like Beyonce, grows up hearing all different sorts of sounds, and that shapes the cultural heritage of modern Houston. Beyonce has said that she grew up idolizing Selena Quintanilla, the star of Tejano music. Now, Selena grew up 50 miles south of Houston. She was born in Lake Jackson, and then her family later moved on to Corpus Christi. Now, Selena is known for Tejano music, but even she was even broader than that. Her very last performance before her death in 1995 was at the Houston Astrodome. And she started off that performance by playing a disco medley. And she often said that the person who inspired her to sing was Donna Summer, the black disco performer. Right, so even though Selena's known for a very regional sort of music, she infused all different sorts of cultural heritage into the way that she played Tejano. Most music in the United States is polycultural. Even music that we very specifically associate with a particular place or a particular ethnic group. I teach a course at U of A called Music in Ethnic America. And one of the things that I discuss is the polycultural heritage of the banjo. My students are often very surprised to learn that banjos have West African roots. Enslaved Africans brought to the Caribbean as well as the American South recreated banjos based on their memories of instruments from West Africa. But of course, once in the South, those West African musical traditions began to merge with others, especially musical traditions brought in by Northern Europeans, British people, Irish and Scottish. So then by the Civil War, you had a musical heritage in the South that was polycultural, that it blended banjo traditions from West Africa with those Northern Europeans. So then you had string bands made up of black people, string bands made up of white people. Here are a couple of examples, right? Notice the same instrumentation. But the people pictured here were born and raised in the Jim Crow South, a period and place that we associate with legal segregation. There is a hierarchy by law of white over black. So one of the points that I wanna make today and keep highlighting is that this polycultural blend in American music does not imply that the people creating the music are equal in society. Polycultural heritages can develop in places that are quite unequal, such as the Jim Crow South. Tonight, I have less than an hour with you, so I can't go through every form of polycultural music in the United States. So what I want to do is spotlight a few examples from my research and from my teaching. We're going to move chronologically through the 20th century, highlighting a popular form of music with every generation. We'll start in New Orleans in the early 1900s. We'll then continue into the big band swing era of the 30s and 40s. We'll then take a journey through rhythm and blues and rock and roll in the 50s and 60s. And I'll wrap up with modern Zotico. So the first soundscape that we're visiting tonight is New Orleans jazz and the creation of that city's distinct sound in the late 19th, early 20th century. Diverse groups of people 
contributed to the sounds that become New Orleans jazz. This is a music born of migration, like most of the forms of music that I'm going to talk about tonight. In New Orleans in the 1880s, waves of black migrants from the Mississippi Delta began to settle in that city looking for urban labor. In, 1880, in the 1880s, approximately 40,000 black migrants from the Mississippi Delta made their way into New Orleans. Those migrants brought with them a very rich musical tradition from the Delta region. For example, they already had an early form of blues by the 1880s, and they had a religious music tradition known as spirituals. Blues and spirituals had something in common. They both used a vocal technique known as the moan. The moan is where singers would stretch and elongate their vocals to create a sound that was a bit mournful to some people's ears. I'm gonna play an example of a moan from the Mississippi region. Listen for those stretched vocals. Whoa, my lead mule crippled in my wheel mule blind. I don't believe I can make it over the danger line. Did the sounds of the moan come to influence New Orleans jazz. When black migrants make it into New Orleans, they go to a city that already has its own diverse musical tradition. And one of those traditions in New Orleans was the brass band marching tradition. Starts in New Orleans around the time of the Civil War through military bands and continued on after. There were different forms of military and then brass bands that were there. White ethnic groups, in New Orleans had their own marching bands that played brass instruments. So Italian-American, Spanish-American, French-American people would play in these bands. So with those instruments, the brass bands that were so common around, black migrants pick up some of those instruments. But when they play, they begin to play using some of the musical aesthetics of the Mississippi Delta. People noticed, for example, that when a Mississippi migrant picked up a cornet, they were stretching the notes like they were moaning. So then they used those instruments to imitate the vocals. New Orleans also had a marching band tradition made up of Creoles of color. Now, whereas Beyonce's Creole family came from rural southwestern Louisiana, New Orleans had an urban population of Creoles. The man pictured here on the screen was born, born Ferdinand Lamont. He changes his name to Jelly Roll Morton. Now before he became Jelly Roll Morton, he was part of an established Creole music tradition that especially favored classical European music. In fact, it was the norm for Creole families to pay for lessons, music lessons for their children, and they learned classical music. Jelly Roll Morton and many of his Creole peers learned this classical music, though, from Mexican migrants. Now, in the 1880s, at the very same time that black migrants were pouring in from the Mississippi Delta, there's also a wave of Mexican musicians who come to New Orleans. They first moved there because of the World's Fair that had been held in New Orleans in that decade. And because New Orleans had this economy for professional music, many of those Mexican instrumentalists stick around. So when they weren't playing in bands, many of them supplemented their income by giving music lessons. So one of those music instructors was named Lorenzo Tio. He and his son become very important to New Orleans music. They called Lorenzo Tio Senior Papa Tio. And he gave lessons to Jelly Roll Morton and many of Morton's peers. Morton said that an entire generation of Creoles learned to play their instruments from Papa Tio. And Jelly Roll Morton learned clarinet and piano specifically. 
But even while he was taking these lessons and learning European classical music, Jelly Roll was attracted to the sounds coming from those Mississippi migrants. He wanted to learn how to play the blues using European instrumentation. And this is what he starts doing. So then in New Orleans, by the turn of the century, you had a polycultural blend of music circulating in that city. The blues and spirituals coming from the Mississippi Delta, the influence of Mexican musicians who gave lessons to Creoles and who also played around the city, not to mention the white ethnic groups who were in the city playing in parades. Now, even though these traditions were often segregated, right, the brass bands tended to be racially exclusive, they played outdoors. They played in parades. So the sounds of this music spread across the city and began to influence the way that people played. So I wanna give an example of a song by Jelly Roll Morton and his band. And listen in the beginning for the sound of a trumpet imitating the moan. these different heritages came to influence the development of New Orleans jazz. It doesn't imply that the Mexican, Creole, white, and black Mississippi people were equal because this was a racially stratified society. It's the world that Louis Armstrong grew up in. Louis Armstrong is a descendant of that migration from the Mississippi Delta. As a teenager, Armstrong was invited to march and play along with a Creole marching band. He was a young man when this happened. Later in life, he pointed to that invitation and that experience of playing with those Creoles as being a highlight of his young life in New Orleans. The reason is because Creoles of color typically did not play with dark-skinned black people. So he had something to prove when he showed up, a dark-skinned man. There were also, besides skin color, some economic differences that separated Creoles and those black migrants. Creoles of color tended to be skilled artisans. They made more money. They were often homeowners. Whereas the migrants moving in from the Mississippi Delta had been sharecroppers. So they come in and they're providing unskilled labor in the city. So there's an economic disparity as well as a racial one over light skin versus dark skin and the privileges that could come along with that in a Jim Crow society. So again, just because the music blended did not imply equality amongst the people there. By the mid 1930s, a new type of jazz had developed in different corners of the United States. Swing music, or otherwise known as big band swing. One difference between big band swing and New Orleans jazz is the size of the band. Louis Armstrong had a band called His Hot Five. Right? The Hot Five, as the name implies, had five people. Jelly Roll Morton played with five or six people. But during Prohibition, the bands began to get bigger. One reason for this was that nightclubs could no longer charge for alcohol service, not legally anyway. So what they do is they start charging people at the door to come in and dance. So in order to make money, they've got to pack in as many dancers into a club as they possibly can. So the nightclubs get bigger. Sometimes they look like giant warehouses. Five or six people are not going to produce enough sound to fill this huge space and keep people dancing for hours. So then some musicians like Fletcher Henderson and Duke Ellington, who's pictured here, begin to expand the bands. 
Instead of having one trumpet player, they might have five or six trumpet players. So then together they produce this huge full sound that keeps people dancing in a huge dance hall. Another difference is that swing has a particular rhythmic signature. In order to swing, the first thing you have to do is to create what are called triplets. Now what you see here on the top are four quarter notes. Each one gets one beat. Below that though shows the triplet. To create this, you divide a quarter note into thirds, all right, creating the triplet. And it sounds like one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four. Let's see if y'all can do this with me. Let's get some audience participation. Let's see if we can swing together tonight. All right, one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four. And all right, very good, give yourselves a hand. That was very nice, very nice. Now, of course, that's just the basic element of swinging because from there, musicians would accent certain beats and then de-stress others to create a more syncopated sound. But the building blocks for this were always the triplets. I'll play an example of this from New York City. On vocals, you're going to hear Ella Fitzgerald, and she's backed by Chip Webb, Chick Webb and his orchestra. Simple melody designed to haunt your memory. It's bound to get you instantly. It doesn't help you to beware before you even know it's there. You're swaying to its catchy air. All right, so songs like Just a Simple Melody, what you just heard, played by a bigger band, and of course, that swing rhythm is there. But one thing that interests me and fascinates me about swing music is that it took on different polycultural forms as it spreads across the United States. Some people think that probably the first people to swing came from places like Harlem and New York, but it didn't stay there. It moves across the country and blends with different regional styles in every place it moves. For example, in the Southwest and West, swing music began to blend with country music to create what is known as Western swing. One of the most popular people in Western swing was a Texan by the name of Bob Wills. Bob Wills was born in Eastern Texas in 1905. He grew up in the middle of Texas cotton country. He was surrounded by the music of black sharecroppers. He could hear them in the cotton fields singing the blues. So Wills grew up with blues being his favorite form of music. In fact, he always said that his very favorite singer was Bessie Smith known as the Empress of the Blues. And according to a family story, Bob Wills once rode 50 miles on horseback to go hear Bessie Smith play. Now, Bob Wills left rural Eastern Texas and moved to the city of Fort Worth. And in Fort Worth, he helped to form a band known as the Texas Playboys. When the Texas Playboys first formed, they were a lot like other country string bands. Initially, they had two fiddle players, a banjo player, and an upright bass, similar to what you would find in what was then called old time music. But then over time, the Playboys began to change their sound. They wanted to swing. So they start adding the types of instrumentation that you would find in string bands. I mean, I mean in uh, the big band swing bands. He added a piano, a trumpet, a saxophone, and even some drums. And the result was Western swing, something that combined these two elements of country Western with big band. I'm gonna play a bit of their theme song, The Playboy Stomp from 1937. Oh, no. 
the Texas Playboys became so popular that in 1944, they were invited to perform at the Grand Ole Opry, which that's a big deal if you're in country music. So in 1944, the Playboys head out there. When they arrived, though, the people backstage at the Grand Ole Opry were not excited to see that jazz instrumentation in the band. The Opry had a rule that you could only play string instruments, nothing associated with jazz, and no drums at all. So after some back and forth, finally the people at the Opry and the Texas Playboys compromised. They were able to go on stage that night, but they had to make the drummer play behind a curtain. <laughs> they were not invited back. <laughs> now if we move farther west, swing music also began to blend with elements of Mexican music. One of the people who did that first is Lalo Guerrero, born and raised here in Tucson. <laughs> Guerrero was one of the first to have swing music with Spanish lyrics. He became especially popular with pachucos, the guys and women out on the West Coast who wore the zoot suits and liked to dance to swing. So here's a bit of Lalo Guerrero. Mi jaina se llama Juana, 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 Juana. Pero ya todos los vatos le dicen marihuana. It's the thing I, I love talking to people in Arizona because y'all know exactly what he was talking about here. <laughs> so that was Marijuana Boogie by Lalo Guerrero. Now, there are other Spanish speaking people who also left their imprint on swing music. If we head back east into Harlem, Harlem was one of the, the most famous black neighborhood probably in the world by 1930 in part because of the great migration of African Americans out of the South and into the urban North. But not all of the black people who lived in Harlem came from the South. In fact, by 1930, at least 25% of Harlem residents were Afro-Caribbean. These were people who came from Jamaica, as well as Spanish-speaking countries like Cuba and Puerto Rico. Musicians who were in Harlem then had to play to a diverse crowd. You had people who were from the South, but you also had these diverse Caribbeans who were there too. They wanted to keep people on the dance floor and having a good time. But how do you do that when people from these different regions play such different music? The Afro-Cubans who moved to Harlem especially played music using distinct rhythms. And they found that they had to figure out a way to blend those rhythms with swing rhythm. A popular rhythmic form brought by Cubans into Harlem was clave rhythm. And this is the basis of a style of music called song. Now clave rhythm occurs when you take five beats and divide them into two measures. Now this is an attempt to translate that into European notation. Now there's a 3-2 clave and a 2-3 clave. And as it implies, the 3-2 clave, you have three beats in the first measure, two in the second. And then it flips for 2-3. So I'm gonna give you an example of that. These are what claves look like, right? Percussion instruments. Here's a 3-2 clave. One, two, three, one, two. One, two, three. One, two. Can y'all say that with me? All right. One, two, three, one, two. One, two, three, one, two. All right. Now, two, three clave is one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, 
One, two, three. Excellent. But now that sounds very different from the swing rhythm that you just did. One of the first groups to combine the two was an act from Cuba known as Machito and his Afro-Cubans. They created a sound that one band member called Jazz on Top, Afro-Cuban on Bottom. <laughs> one of the first songs that they created, which became a sort of theme song for them, was Tanga from 1943. This type of music became a sort of sonic signature for Harlem. By the late 1940s, other musicians also began to merge African-American with Afro-Cuban. One famous example is Dizzy Gillespie. Dizzy Gillespie hired an Afro-Cuban drummer because he wanted that combination. And one of the collaborations to come out of that by Dizzy Gillespie was a song called Manteca. And these songs, like Tanga and Manteca, wind up influencing all different sorts of genres. It's the root of Boogaloo from New York. It's a root of Afro-Cuban jazz. So it starts with this combination of African-American and Afro-Cuban and goes on generation to generation to continue to influence the music. The person most well-known for swing music in the 1930s and 40s was a man who moved to New York from Chicago a young Jewish man by the name of Benny Goodman. Benny Goodman was born in Chicago in 1909. His parents were immigrants. His mother was from Lithuania, his father came from Poland. As a young man, Benny Goodman was drawn to the clarinet and he began to play swing music because it was the most popular music of his time. He moves out to New York City and got a radio show and then he began to build a band. One thing that was unique about Benny Goodman that not a lot of people did was he had an interracial band, as you can see pictured here on this slide. He hired black players, he hired white players as well. In fact, one of his musicians who he hired for the band was Lionel Hampton, pictured in the foreground here, who played vibraphone and went on to form his own very popular band. Goodman's quartet was the first to play swing at Carnegie Hall. In 1938, they were invited there, and it helped cement big band swing as the most popular form of music. Though, oddly, he didn't have a big band, he just had a quartet. <laughs> this is Moon Glow, which they played that night at Carnegie Hall in 1938. Goodman became so popular with his version of swing that he actually earned the name the King of Swing. But this name was controversial. It was controversial because there were many people of African descent who didn't like the fact that the King of Swing was a white man, although there were diverse people of color who had contributed to this form of music. And one reason why this was controversial in communities of color is that in the previous decade, in the 1920s, the person known as the king of jazz had been a white man, whose name was, oddly enough, Paul Whiteman. <laughs> so Paul Whiteman, a white man, was the king of jazz. Benny Goodman, 
a Jewish white man was the king of swing. So there were plenty of people of color who had some resentment over this, who thought even though these forms of music have, are diverse, played by diverse people, the men crowned as king tended to be white men. This wasn't just a story about jazz. This continues. By the 1940s, by the mid-40s, after World War I, the form of music known as rhythm and blues slowly starts to replace swing in popularity. The forms of music had some similarities, and in many ways, rhythm and blues is an outgrowth of swing. For example, the saxophones of swing still dominated rhythm and blues in the late 40s into the 1950s. And also, rhythm and blues artists like Little Richard, pictured here, would swing their music too. So there was a similarity there, a carryover from the big band era. When I was a little girl, I remember seeing Little Richard on television all the time. He would show up at award shows in the 80s and proclaim himself the king of rock and roll. I saw him do this on the Grammy Awards and all different types of awards. He would get up on stage and say, I invented rock and roll. I'm the king, not Elvis, I'm the king. And when I grew older, I realized that what he was talking about is that rhythm and blues artists like himself often saw their songs remade by white artists. White artists who then often made more money from the music. In fact, Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, his first songs, his first hits, were remakes of rhythm and blues songs. But they were rebranded as rock and roll. So in the 50s, people like Little Richard were very upset to see the same song rebranded and making more money. Now, Little Richard and Elvis Presley came from the polycultural South. Elvis was from Tupelo, Mississippi, which is an area with a very large African-American population. So he also grew up with blues and gospel and these types of forms. Yet, being a white man, he was able to play in venues and be played on radio stations that sometimes wouldn't touch black artists. Little Richard's first major hit was the song Tutti Frutti. But he saw that be remade by a white artist by the name of Pat Boone. <laughs> so let's hear these two different versions of Tutti Frutti. Wop, bop, loom, bop, 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 Tutti Frutti. Little Richard's version of Tutti Frutti was popular. It put him on the map as a rhythm and blues artist. But Pat Boone outsold him. And his version went higher on the pop charts than Little Richard's did. That Little Richard thought that this had to do with the two men's different image. It's important to know some background about Little Richard. He started his career in a traveling musical troupe that used to crisscross the South, playing in small black venues. He got his start on those traveling shows as a drag queen. He performed in drag. His name was Princess LaVon. He performed in high heels, a wig, full makeup, and he loved it. But when he got signed to a record label, of course, they made him put away the high heels and pearls. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was still very clear to many audiences when they saw Little Richard that they were seeing a queer black man. He still wore long hair. He still wore pancake makeup. And so Little Richard always felt that the reason why record companies needed Pat Boone to remake his songs is because they were uncomfortable with a queer black man going into white homes. 
it's important to also remember the historical context. Little Richard first became popular in the mid-50s, 1955. One year earlier had been the Brown versus Board of Education decision, where the Supreme Court ruled that segregated schools were unconstitutional. The Brown decision sets off a wave of hysteria, especially in the South, as many white parents feared what would happen if their white children went to school with black children. And the subtext for this was always interracial sex. <laughs> so at the same time that you have all these white parents concerned about their children going to school with black children and possibly coupling up, you've got Little Richard and other rhythm and blues artists coming through the radio into those white homes. So then the backlash against rhythm and blues and the need to have white artists remake it for white consumption has to do with this fear over integration and the civil rights movement at the same time. In 1984, Little Richard commented on this. He said, quote, they needed a rock star to block me out of white homes because I was a hero to white kids. The white kids would have Pat Boone up on the dresser and me in the drawer because they liked my version better. But the families didn't want me because of the image that I was projecting. Right? And of course, that image was not only black, but also queer. So these issues over appropriation, when, the, when black artists accuse white artists of appropriation, it has less to do very often with anger that they're playing black music or music that's influenced by black people. It has a lot more to do with the economics of it that a lot of white acts were able to prosper more through because of white privilege and because of gender privilege in many cases as well. In my research on Texas though, I found far fewer issues over appropriation between African Americans and Mexican Americans. By the 1950s, many Mexican American rhythm and blues acts we're part of the Chitlin Circuit. How many of you have heard of the Chitlin Circuit before? All right, that was the name given to the informal networks of bars and clubs that hired African-American artists to come and play. In places like Houston, Mexican-American rhythm and blues acts were part of the Chitlin Circuit. And I think that one of the reasons why I never found these accusations of appropriation was because of an acknowledgement that Mexican-Americans also were a subjugated group in a Jim Crow society. They were also disfranchised. There were also lynchings of Mexican Americans in places like South Texas. So I think that there's an acknowledgement of a shared experience with Jim Crow segregation in places like Texas that led to less animosity over polycultural blending between the two groups. One of those Mexican-American rhythm and blues acts came out of San Antonio, Sunny and the Sunliners. Sunny and the Sunliners met in high school and formed a band. That band was influenced in part by rhythm and blues acts from the East. They especially liked Fats Domino from New Orleans. But the Sunliners also heard the music that their parents played. And the most popular form of Mexican-American music in Texas after World War II was called Orquesta. Orquesta was really the Tejano, the Texas Mexican-American version of swing. It also had the trumpets and the horns and often also used swing rhythm. So here's an example of the type of orquesta that people like Sunny and the Sunliners would have heard growing up. the Sunliners then said that when they started playing rhythm and blues, orchestra was always in the back of their heads. 
All right, they try to blend the two for their fans. Now, quick shout out to Maurice Magana, who is going to be giving a presentation right here next week on hip hop and its visual cultures in Mexico. Maurice is going to be talking much more about Sunny and the Sunliners. So you have to come back next week, same time, same place. <laughs> now the Sunliners played their first gigs in black clubs in Houston. They became so popular on the local rhythm and blues scene down there that local radio stations began to play them. The first DJ to put them on the air in Houston was a black man by the name of Skipper Lee Frazier. His radio name was Skipper Lee. Skipper Lee loved the Sunliner sound and the way that they incorporated orchestra into their sound. He said that he loved the bright, crisp horns of orchestra. Skipper Lee also managed an African-American band from Houston who had formed in a local high school known as Archie Bell and the Drills. Now, Archie Bell and the Drills could sing and dance, but they didn't play instruments. So Skipper Lee hired Sonny and the Sunliners to play as the backing band to Archie Bell and the Drills. The two acts would tour together between San Antonio and New Orleans, playing at clubs in between the two cities on the Gulf Coast. When it was time for Archie Bell and the Drills to record their first album, Skipper Lee wanted to keep the Tejano influence strong. So he has Mexican musicians come in and play on their first single. That single became a number one hit song in the year 1968. It was called The Tighten Up. Now in The Tighten Up, it's kind of an instrumental forward song. And in this song, Archie Bell is the lead vocalist, calls out to different instruments, right? He says, let me hear the bass. Now let me hear the drums. And then he says, now make it mellow. And that's when the Tejano horns from Orquesta come in. So I'm gonna play a bit of Tighten Up and listen for the horns of Orquesta and that influence. I said, if you can do it now, the show will be tough. Now look here. Now, before Beyonce came on the scene, Tighten Up was the most famous rhythm and blues song in Houston's history, right? Number one hit in 68. But most people listening to it probably didn't realize that the imprint of Mexican-American orchestra is part of the DNA of that very song. As the 20th century progressed, that musical relationship between black and Mexican-American Texans only deepened especially in Houston neighborhoods. In the 70s, because of an economic crisis in Mexico, the Mexican population of Houston began to skyrocket. Those migrants who were moving into Houston primarily moved into old black neighborhoods. And in part, that was because the property was cheaper in those kinds of neighborhoods. So then you end up in the 80s and 90s with neighborhoods that are black and brown. And because of this shared space, I believe this is another reason why I haven't found these accusations of appropriation between the two groups. They feel that they've built a shared heritage together in their neighborhoods. For example, the school that Archie Bell and the Drills went to was Phyllis Wheatley High School in Houston's Fifth Ward. By the turn of the 21st century, Phyllis Wheatley High School was about half Latino. So then people who come of age in a place like Phyllis Wheatley feel like they come from a mixed heritage community where different people have merged to create a new sound. A rapper from Houston 
A rapper from Houston who calls himself H-Town Slim has a quote that I think succinctly says that black-brown combination in Houston neighborhoods. He said, quote, where is the line between black and Mexican neighborhoods? We share our culture. That black-brown shared culture has influenced every form of music in modern Houston. For example, a popular rapper in that city goes by the name of Chingo Bling. Chingo Bling's parents immigrated to Houston from Mexico. And in his rap songs, he constantly fuses Mexican culture with Houston's brand of hip hop. For example, it's common for Chingo Bling to have songs with accordion in it. Houston's probably one of the only places in the country where rap music has accordion. He also has songs that incorporate the genre of banda into hip hop. So then, Houston music has been for decades this dialogue between black American and Mexican American. That blend can also be found in the music known as Zotico. Now, Zotico has a very special history in the city of Houston. It's rooted in that migration of Creoles from southwestern Louisiana into Houston in the early 20th century. Those Creoles brought a form of music known as Lala. Lala was played with an accordion and a washboard that had been converted into a musical instrument. When Lala moved into Houston, it began to blend with rhythm and blues. In around 1949 or 1950, a folklorist by the name of Robert McCormick, his nickname was Mac, went to Houston to record rhythm and blues music. When he arrived to Houston, people there told him that he had to go to the community of Fifth Ward because there he would hear a form of music like nothing he'd heard. So he goes to Fifth Ward and he hears a style of music that blended la la and R&B. He started asking people what they call it, and they were telling him the name of a song, the name of a popular La La song. That song was called Les Zaricos en Pasale. That means the beans aren't salty. <laughs> beans Les Zarico. So for shorthand, people in the community were starting to call this music Les Zarico. So McCormick thought, this music isn't exactly la la. It's changed. It's merged with rhythm and blues. But with those accordions and the drums, it's, an, it's a little different from the rhythm and blues that he'd heard before. So McCormick was the one, while visiting Houston, who decided to call this music Zadico. And McCormick created the spelling Z-Y-D-E-C-O that it's known as now. McCormick passed away in 2015. And he was always very angry that musicians from Louisiana claimed the name Zotico. He said no, he meant for Zotico to refer to that blend that he found in Houston, whereas what was played in Louisiana was La La. But of course, these musics keep going back and forth between the, new state, between the two states. Zotico today in Houston is often played by young people from different backgrounds. One similarity between Creole music and Mexican-American music is the emphasis on accordions. So we often find blending between those two groups. The man pictured here is Ruben Moreno. Ruben Moreno was from the Fifth Ward neighborhood in Houston. He calls himself Chicano Creole. His mother is a Creole of color. His father is Mexican-American. The Mexican side of his family is Grammy Award winning. They have a rich musical tradition. The Creole side of his family is also quite musical. They have Zotico clubs in Fifth Ward. So Ruben Moreno grew up with this blended culture. He's a perfect example of polycultural music and the blending that has taken shape in communities where different people have migrated and created a blended heritage. So the last thing I'm gonna play for you tonight is Ruben Moreno's brand 
of Creole Chicano Zadico. Bro Cafe Live, are you ready? World Cafe Live, are you ready? Arthur, Arthur Corbin in the building. Do we got Houston, Texas in the house? Pennsylvania in the building. Maryland in the house. Upstate New York. All right, y'all, we're gonna do it like this. 